Upley, and I'm the writer, director, and executive producer of Stab 5, and I also played a version of myself in Stab 5. After the success of Stab 4, the cast and I knew that we had to do a sequel. Um, to go viral overnight was really, really exciting for us, and we instantly kind of started talking about ideas of where it would go. And originally, Stab 5 was going to follow the Sarah Campbell storyline still, and we were going to see how that kind of progressed. I had written um, about half of a script that still continued her storyline, and I just, I, I wasn't in love with it. I, I didn't feel like I wanted to do as much of a parody as we had done with Stab 4, so I really worked and thought hard about what I wanted to do with Stab 5. And... Later, when Scream 4 came out, it was revealed that there was supposed to be time travel in Stab 5, but while we were filming our version of Stab 5, Scream 4 still hadn't been released. So we had no idea that there was supposed to be time travel in it. And I'm not sure we would have included it anyways. That's a question we get asked a lot about Stab 5, is uh, why there's no time travel. And that's why. Scream 4 hadn't come out yet, we didn't know it was going to be there, and it's kind of cheesy, like, let's not lie. Plus, the budgets we work with, we didn't really know where we could time travel to. Because even if we time travel to something easy like the 80s or the 90s or something like that, we could change people's hair and outfits and stuff, but you can't really change the outside world or the way a house looks, and we didn't have the budget to do something like that. So there is no time travel in our Stab 5. But Stab 5 marks the first of our own kind of original Stab trilogy. Stab 5, 6, and 7 were kind of planned to be one big chunk. Uh, of movies that would end the series and Stab 4 was just kind of a place that it all started. What I really like about the Stab movies and the Scream movies is how they play on the levels of reality like a movie within a movie within a movie within a movie within a movie and so on and so forth. So every step we took as we kept making the Stab movies after that kind of tries to raise the level of meta reality that we're now a part of. After scrapping the idea to continue the Sarah Campbell storyline, I wanted to do something that I could actually bring back the actors we had worked with before and kind of give them a second chance. Uh, now that we had learned some things and discovered some of our mistakes during filming and taught ourselves better ways or slightly better ways to do things, I wanted to give everyone another chance to come back and play a character and have a proper death scene and have a movie that was a little bit more put together than Stab 4. So Karen from Stab 4 actually bought us a new camera. It was still a little mini camera, but it did higher quality and it put out a much better picture. We could have kept using the same camera we used in Stab 4, but we upgraded to a slightly less ghetto version in Stab 5, and we can't thank Karen enough for that. It really did improve everything. The only thing that was really wrong about that camera is, if you watch it, it has this weird autofocus feature, and we couldn't turn it off. So there was no option to turn it off, so the movie kind of goes in and out of focus a lot. But it was still handheld, just like in Stab 4, nobody was wearing mics, everybody had to talk loud, and you know, audio is a thing when your camera's all the way across the room, and the actors on the opposite side of the room and you can't hear them so it was much like stage acting in the fact that we had to project a lot too. I decided that Stab 5 was now going to be about real life. It was going to be about us trying to make Stab 5. Kind of in the vein of Scream 3 where they're making Stab 3 uh, but now we were all going to play ourselves. Everyone who was in Stab 4 was going to come back and instead of me being Jay McConnell I was now going to be Joshua Dudley. And Everyone was an exaggerated version of themselves. Nobody actually is super true to character. I mean, a lot of them have some similar tendencies of what they played, including myself. You know, I'm a control freak. I get a little loud and I'm a little nuts about doing stuff. But nothing on, on this level of crazy that any of them went to, you know. I was Stephanie Mayu. I played Shannon Nightingale in Stab 5. Josh... Josh is a lot to handle sometimes. He's a lot of fun, but don't piss him off and really don't mess with his baby. And his baby is the stab. Like, don't mess with stab. Come prepared, come ready to work and listen and do what he needs you to do because if not, he doesn't take it lightly. <laughs> um, and that's not saying he doesn't like to have fun because he definitely does have fun. And sometimes we over shock time because we just had so much fun that we ended up filming way later than we even thought possible. And he's actually very lenient for the most part. Um, a lot of people I think take advantage of him. I think it's just kind of hard because a lot of people are working and like trying to fit in where you can meet up and 
get everybody together with their schedules and then you know you're not getting paid so a lot of people just don't take it that serious which I dealt with in other staff series um, people just not showing up on time and stuff but for the most part Josh keeps it very professional and he goes over and beyond for people I mean he used to call me his muse and he took so many photos of me, he made little special things for me, he took my ideas, he implemented it in other stabs. I mean, you can't really go wrong with having a director that's so open and professional at the same time. And they all played such crazy versions of themselves, like Amanda Constant and Shayna Roystan playing lesbians was just hilarious because neither one of them are lesbians in real life. As I said, Amanda's boyfriend at the time of Stab 4 was the boyfriend in the scene was Alex Wenta who plays a different character in Stab 5 where they're basically not connected at all but it was great and everybody really gave it their all and they really tried their hardest because they knew Stab 4 was such a success and I think everyone could feel that Stab 5 had a lot of people waiting for it and we all wanted it to be the best that it could be. My character in Staff 5 was an asshole. He was a, a complete and total asshole. He ran the show and he was a drama queen and he was a bitch and he had respect for nobody and if you didn't do what he said, he didn't give a fuck, you were done. And, you know, that's, that's not totally me in real life. I am a little aggressive, so I, we do compare a little because I'm also the director too, but I am insane, but I'm not that insane. But playing him, playing the Staff version of Josh is always like, super super fun because he's a fucking lunatic and <laughs> it's rare that I get to go there so Stab 5 is a bigger moment for my character because he's alive and uh, because he stands out quite a bit because he really only cares about his production he doesn't really care about the people involved in it and that's not me at all I love everybody in our movies and I'm so grateful for them so everybody in Stab 5 thank you I love you Hi, I'm Rachel Alexandria Arnold and I play Rachel Alexandria Arnold in Stab 5 and I was executive producer as well. So my character in Stab 5 is an exaggerated version of myself and a lot of my character echoes what's going on in real life. Um, even though I know Josh will not agree with this, I play his assistant in the movie and that's kind of what was happening in real life too. Um, but you see a lot of growth happen. I started very meager and timid and took a lot of the bad behavior from Josh's character. And by the end, I, I end up quitting. I have had enough. I decide that I'm you know, worth more, that my mental health is worth more, and decide that that's not a good situation for me, and I quit. So it was interesting to, one, as I've said before, not considering myself an actress, to try and act, but also to act almost two separate characters, because I start one way and end a completely stronger version of who I was playing. Um, so it was a lot of fun, it was challenging and interesting, but uh, Rachel and Staff 5 is probably my favorite because she suffers no fools by the end of that movie. And that's what starts, I guess, my ascend to being Stab Queen. Jennifer Sue Mallard also came back, which was great, and she kind of takes over the leading role in Stab 5, and the movie's kind of based around her which was great because we just loved her so much as Heather Gale that we really wanted to expand on her and give her something different to play that wasn't like an over-the-top crazy person. So she gets to play a real girl, a real, a real normal girl, who is the main idea of the attacks. You know, someone's trying to kill off all of the stars of Stab 4, and she's one of the biggest stars, so she's the main target. And as her boyfriend, we actually have Dave Fine, who plays a character named Dave. <laughs> that shows you how creative I am sometimes. He plays her boyfriend via webcam, and all of his stuff really was filmed via webcam, and he was never in New Hampshire with us, and we even rehearsed with him via webcam, and goddamn, Dave Fine is amazing. If you don't know who he is, YouTube him, Google him. Dave is awesome, you'll love him. And he did such a killer performance via webcam for us, like, we'll never forget him. Like, we had such a great time with him. Such a fucking great time with Dave Fine. We love you, Dave Fine. <laughs> my name is Dave Fine. I am old enough to know my age. 33. I played, I played the character I played. So you already, I don't have to answer that question. You, you already know that, you already know. I'm pretty sure I just played myself. So, you know, I just relate to being weird. Like, I mean, look at this fucking hair. You know, I'm in quarantine. What do you want me to say, Josh? I think I've been in one stab movie production, but it felt like 20. How many stab movies are there, Josh? 
I don't, I don't even know if I lived or died. I don't, I don't, I was like over a webcam, you know? I hope I lived so I can be in sequels. I want to be a killer. If I could be a killer, that would be great. Not in real life, but you know, in, in your, in your movies. Overall, the Stan movie experience, the production, they're, they're really, you know, this is, this is coming from a director who's passionate, uh, creative, and, and family oriented. So, you know, Stab Movie Productions is like a big family, you know, and there's no uh, conflict, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very, very nice. And, and um, you know, every, everybody supportive. We all, you, you know, you're all, all supportive cast. Well, look at how many people, you know, have, have, have been in these and, and, and worked on them, you know, so. You got to be doing something right, and everybody's got to be enjoying it. So there's nothing more enjoy enjoyable than you know being creative with other creative folks, especially stab movies. I mean, you're a fucking you know scream fan. Hello, nothing better than a stab movie. You know, uh, I mean, look, and look how how long they've been going on for. You know, so you, how you know this is mega respect for all the stab movie productions. No better production to be involved with. Um, you know, it, it's all about fun. And, and, you know, what else is there? I don't know anymore, you know, it's, I'm, it's a fucking apocalypse. Stabbing is the best way to kill, anyway. It's the most entertaining form of killing, you know, I think so. And, and, and you know, Josh really captures that classic, uh, you, you know, what do they call those kind of horror movies? Um, you know, you know, the stuff we, we grew up on with Jason and Scream and... Uh, Freddy Krueger, Cougar, Cougar, whatever the fuck, and, uh, you know, Michael Myers, like, there is, that is nostalgic, that was when filmmaking was just, you know, in the heart, in the 90s, man, I'm telling you, the 90s were great, so, you know, Josh really knows how to bring people together, and, and have, he has major respect for everybody's craft, and a lot of heart, he's got a big old heart, and you can see that, uh, through the movies. You know, being in a, a stab movie production, uh, there's no better experience you can have. There's a lot of experiences in life, and and having experienced being in a stab movie, I mean, that's the experience of experiences. Dave really brought a lot, and a lot of the stuff he does in there that's not direct lines is ad-libbed, and he really just, just kills it. He's much needed comedic relief, especially in the middle of like death scenes and stuff too, that they're on the computer talking to him. It, it was great to have him, and we wish we could have brought him back more. What we also didn't know or even think about at the time when I was writing the script is that a lot of people would see Dave as the red herring of the film, like that he's setting up to be the killer, that he's going to be the killer, because you only see him via webcam. So how do you know he's not just actually hiding in a hotel room somewhere waiting <laughs> to reveal himself as the killer? And he is the lead girl's boyfriend, so it would totally make sense. <laughs> but nope. It was all via webcam, so Dave could never be the killer because he would have to be the killer via webcam. So, <laughs> thank you, Dave. You did awesome. It felt so easy to do, and like I just had a, a natural connection with Jen and Chris that it felt like I had been friends with them forever. So it just felt so genuine. That scene, really, even looking back at it now, just was a very genuine scene where we all just connected. And then later on, when I get stabbed in my throat, um, it's, it's it, I don't know, I, I love gore, I love blood, so I was really excited. Um, just like falling away and just bleeding out just seemed like a fun idea to me. I do really appreciate the gore of Josh, and there's always so much blood. I mean, blood to the point where it stains your hair because you have bleach in it, and it stains your bra, and it stains your skin, and it's just all over the walls now, and we're all trying to scrub it clean, so Josh doesn't really hold back when it comes to giving the gore, I think. So when I did get stabbed in my throat it was actually a real knife being swung at my face which you know normal people might have a problem with but i have an older brother and we used to throw knives at each other i they were butter knives but we did throw them at each other so i thought it would be like fun to just try it you know and luckily i didn't get stabbed so there are many moments in stab five that were based in actual reality too there's a conversation that jen mallater and i have about her character in stab five 
And that was a real conversation we had in real life. And I kind of translated it into the script to fit it into the script. But so that was the idea when we started is that everybody is now playing themselves. We get introduced to um, Veronica, played by Ariel. And Josh has always been really, really great about making characters fit for people. Um, so like I was an exaggerated, my character was an exaggerated form of myself. Veronica was definitely uh, a version of Ariel, which is cool. And so many others. Um, but it was fun to see characters really custom written for the actors and actresses that played. So that was the first really cool thing that was exciting. Hi, my name is Arielle Kaplan, and I played Veronica Clark in Stab 5. Veronica was not a very nice person. Uh, she knew that she had a lot of talent. She knew that she was going to be a star. She only had the chance to do so. And she had a lot of self-preservation going on and she was going to exploit her castmates in order to stay alive as long as possible. Unfortunately, that does not work out so well for her in the end. I would like to hope that Veronica is not based on me in any way. We had a larger cast, some that actually had experience. Um, so Staff 5 was really exciting for us. It was a really, really exciting time. A typical day of filming would be we would get in, we would run uh, what we wanted to do a couple of times, Josh would talk us through how he wanted the scene to look. We would take a couple of different takes and then we would film it a couple of times for real. I remember a lot of late nights. I remember a lot of camaraderie. It was a lot of fun to be in a stabmovies.com production. A couple of the scenes that I was in, we shot at night. So we had to be up, we had to be focused, and we still had to be giving great performances, even though it was ticking on towards 11, 12, 1 in the morning. Uh, so it was really, it was a really great time to bond together with my castmates. Several I knew before, several I met uh, during the course of Stab 5, and it was really fun. I really loved the script for Stab 5. I thought it was snappy. I thought it was uh, really unique in the story that they were trying to tell. And I thought that my character was really fun because it's always interesting to play someone who is not very nice and, and to go into the motivations of why they are that way. Stab 5 also introduces a lot of new characters. I like the idea of having a reporter involved because it keeps that Gail Weathers aspect kind of in there. So we brought on Heidi Nicole to play Kylie Scott. And uh, she's just in it for a few minutes in Stab 5. She has a quick little news sequence here and there. And then we really, really expand her role in Stab 6, but she was fun to work with. And that's why her role got expanded. When we cast her in Stab 5, she was a friend of a friend of a friend and so on and so forth. And uh, she auditioned too and still got cast as the news anchor who didn't even have a name at the time. And then I came up with a name for her. And then once the name kind of was in my brain, I kind of started seeing this character developing further. So Kylie's character starts are really small in Stab 5 and then gets huge in Stab 6. And her character would have continued into the opening scene of Stab 7, but she would have died. In both versions of Stab 7, Rachel's character kills the Kylie character or Kylie ends up dead somehow by Rachel's hand, directly or indirectly. <laughs> but she did a great job. Bringing the cast back, though, was just the best experience. Bringing Karen back, having Chris Doobie back, and then mixing Jen back, and mixing them with the newbies, like Patricia Shanley, who was friends with a lot of people, too, because she also worked at the restaurant that we had all worked at originally. Uh, having her come in as the Regina character was just awesome, because, again, in real life, she's a cool lady, but you don't fuck with her. She a bad bitch. <laughs> So it was cool to have her play such a tough uh, cop who also had this really funny soft side that I made her an author too. She was an aspiring author and I think that was an attempt at trying to develop characters a little bit further than they had been in the first couple of movies. But it was a weird mix to have people from the first movie playing themselves and then to have the new actors in Stab 5 playing characters. So Stab 5 overall was just like a really exciting experience. We got to do a lot more stuff that we didn't get to do the first time. There were so many challenges. We filmed in the winter time in New Hampshire, which whose idea was that? And uh, there was snow and ice involved. I remember Karen 
at in her death scene she literally was in the snow in her front yard it had snowed that night and she was dying in the snow and i don't think i've ever felt so badly for one of our cast members because she is the sweetest thing and she was a champ and she never complained everybody else was like are you really okay do you swear you're okay because you're making me cold just watching you and she powered through it shout out to karen we love you karen died outside after her house got teepeed and you know karen's so awesome to our productions that i wanted to give her a really fun death scene and she's not really in much else of stab five aside from this one scene so she originally she was going to get a phone call, but we cut that and I wanted everyone to remember that it was a Christmas movie or was set and during the holidays. So uh, she's outside fixing her Christmas lights and her house got teepees and she's yelling at teenagers, which is not like Karen. Karen is so sweet and loving and supporting. So it was so funny to even see her raise her voice at all. Like I, Karen honestly is like she was our set mom a lot in the movies it, during Stab five, four and six. So. Karen is an amazing woman, but, and she went through so much in Stab 5 in that death scene. Like, she got fake stabbed, I swung a real knife at her. It was actually raining out while we were filming and we didn't have a lot of protection <laughs> to cover us up with. And we actually put up these big tarp things and they were making all this noise so we couldn't use them. So we had to film in the rain. Karen got stabbed to death in the rain and then got dragged through the snow, which took multiple takes, which is, if you look close, you could see a lot of cuts in that scene because it took a lot of effort to fix that. Karen is such a trooper, and like I said, we can never thank her and her husband enough for what they've done for stab movies. We loved working with Audrey, but we really wanted something shocking for the audience to realize that they were now in reality and we were no longer in the world of stab four. So killing off the lead girl in the opening scene is kind of just like, over the top crazy and we knew we had to do it and Audrey was really gung-ho about it she was happy to come back and film that scene and she was happy that that was the way her character was going out because um, it wasn't Sarah Campbell anymore it was now her and it shows the difference between the Sarah Campbell character and the character of Audrey not Audrey as a real person but the character of Audrey it's a little more realistic in what would happen if a killer came and attacked you like Sarah Campbell didn't put up too much of a fight in Stab 4 and Audrey tries to put up a fight in Stab 5, but man, she gets her freaking ass kicked. But uh, we knew that would shock the audience, and it would make them realize that this wasn't Stab 4 or the world of Stab 4 anymore. It was a whole new reality, and the actress that played Sarah Campbell had just gotten murdered within the first, like, seven minutes of the movie. And that was an incredible experience. Audrey has this huge tribute scene to the opening scene of Scream where she's kind of going back and forth with the killer on the phone and they're testing each other's knowledge to see how far they can get into the movie. Audrey just kills that scene. Rihanna does a great job too. Uh, getting her to come back was fun and the way we got her to come back was the fact that we actually let her kind of talk shit about Stab 4 and we wrote it into the script. We addressed some issues that we were having in real life where uh, there was fans on like message boards talking shit and uh, how actors felt maybe about their performances. Like I said, Rihanna wasn't super into her performance in Stab 4, so she got a chance to say that on camera in a movie that, you know, we did our best. We tried, and if people want to talk shit, that's up to them. Rachel actually wasn't here for this part of filming either. She didn't film a scene with us. Rihanna actually helps out a lot with the camera work. Filming on that balcony and throwing Audrey through that glass door was super fun, but super intense at the same time. Like, it took a lot of different shots to get it right. A lot of precise timing to throw fake plastic glass with her and we had two different kinds of fake glass we had this like really rubbery fake glass and then we had like shards of fake glass that were plastic but they actually hurt so audrey and i were actually covered in little cuts after we filmed the scene because some of the fake glass that was getting thrown around at us or that we landed on actually cut us like even though it's fake glass so it shouldn't have cut us and the fight scene itself hurt too there's a part where audrey kicks off the porch and pushes me into a wall and we hadn't really rehearsed it. Like I said, just like step four, there wasn't really a lot of rehearsal time. So I get thrown into the wall and there was something on the wall that stabbed me in the back. So you see me kind of slowly slide down the wall in pain. Like that's real. <laughs> that is real. I really got hurt there. And then moments later, as we continue to film the death scene, Audrey actually gets hurt as we go to impale her through the throat. 
uh, I actually whacked her head on the piece of fake plexiglass that was sticking out of the door frame. And she didn't bleed and there was no cuts or anything. It was more of a shock. For almost all of our movies, we use a real knife for a good majority of it. Audrey really had the knife swung at her, a real knife swung at her, and I was the one swinging it at her. And I had practiced a lot up until the point of Audrey hitting her head on the plastic glass and me hitting my back. Nobody had ever really gotten hurt while we were filming. But I do remember being very, very, very nervous filming that scene with her. Um, we had finally upgraded the mask and found like rubber versions of the ghost face mask. So we were able to line the eyes and now I had much darker eyes that I couldn't see through when I was swinging a knife at people. So the first time that we did the shot of Audrey going through the door and landing and me coming out and stabbing her in the back twice, I actually thought I stabbed her one of the times and I stopped and she was screaming so loud that it seemed real. So I thought I really, really, really stabbed her and I stopped and like threw the knife and like took off the mask and. She was just actually a really great actress, and I was a better stuntman than I thought, because it looked real, but it wasn't real. But man, that scared the fucking shit out of me. I won't forget that one. I really thought I stabbed Audrey, and I'm so happy I didn't. This is another thing we get a lot of questions about with the fans, is the shirt that Rihanna is wearing in Stab 5 in the opening scene. When the close-ups make the shirt look like a different color, because a trick that we've used in a lot of our movies to stab people is to put the shirt that they were wearing over a cardboard box that has been padded with stuff so that we can actually stab into it and kind of make it look real and stuff like that. We forgot to film her close-up stabs in the apartment we were filming in for that opening scene, so I filmed them later at my apartment and the lighting was different, and I didn't think about that at the time, so when I try to cut them together, they look like they're a different color shirt, like it goes from green to yellow, from green to yellow to green to yellow, but it's actually the same shirt, it's just in different lighting, and we even try to fix it in post and change the color of the shirt, but then it was changing the color of the blood and the kitchen, and so yeah, you know, little things happen. The other big thing that happens between Stab 4 and Stab 5 is that Shannon Nightingale gets replaced. Even though the character of Shannon Nightingale is a real person in Stab 5, she's now played by Stephanie Mayhew. Shannon Nightingale, the original Shannon Nightingale, came back and filmed the, her end sequence, and then days after that got into a terrible car accident and couldn't continue production. She couldn't walk for months. It was a huge thing and a terrible loss for all of us. Like I think we all really felt for her. It, it wasn't like in Stab 5 when we realized we have to replace Audrey and my character's an asshole. Like We were all in genuine shock. And we were all genuinely worried about our friend, not about the actress in the movie. Like, Shannon was our friend, so that was a big thing. And we knew recasting her was going to be hard, but honestly, we didn't have a choice, and we had to focus on letting Shannon Nightingale get better. She has since recovered. For anyone that's wondering, she's back on her feet. She's doing great today. Stab 5 was a little different than the other stabs because Shannon was fun-loving and... She didn't have anything to worry about until later on where she sees a psychic and she tells her that she's going to die. The character was really fun to play. It was pretty easy. I actually took over for another Shannon. Um, my name's not Shannon, it's Stephanie. Most of the characters in the movie play their names. Um, so that was a little different from my character. And I didn't see anything that Shannon had already done. Unfortunately, she was in a car accident and couldn't move forward. So I was notified by Josh. Um, somebody had seen a movie that I was in called The Darkness Within, and he asked if I would be interested in playing in a stab series, and I was like, absolutely. I love horror, I love a Scream, and I was all about it, and the whole thing was just really fun. I got to get stabbed in my throat and choke a bunch of blood and get really dirty and meet a bunch of new people and just see how the other side works because in the other films that I did, I didn't get to stay on set so long. So I actually got to see them set up more with lighting and sets and like background and going to different locations. So it was all new for me and I was like a little girl in a candy shop. I remember from the first day that she was on set, I was in absolute awe. She was fun and energetic, sometimes too much, <laughs> but she acted amazingly. And I remember just watching her act in some of her scenes and actually being terrified of her. Whether it be 
something that she was doing where she was scared or if it was just normal. She was, it was just on all the time. Steph was probably one of my favorite people of Stab 5 because that was the first time that we had somebody that was so experienced and it was really, really fun to watch. The whole end sequence got filmed twice, twice, twice. So the character of Dylan was actually written for a different person. And um, this was another girl that we worked with at a restaurant and she was awesome. And there's a lot of the lines that Dylan has, she calls herself this bitch. And that was because this girl at this restaurant that we all worked at together called herself that all the time. She said, this bitch doesn't play that or whatever, you know? So a lot of the character was actually based on her. And that's one of the blessings of doing these movies is that I get to write for people a lot. Uh, instead of just creating the characters, I, I get to kind of pander to people's positives and the things that I know that they do well. So this part was written for somebody else, and then she actually got cancer. So our um, it was skin cancer, and it wasn't too serious, but she had to have some surgeries and stuff like that. So we had to replace her in the movie. Again, no hard feelings. We totally understood and wished her the best. And you know, obviously, skin cancer, like go take care of that. <laughs> That's way more important than making this movie for YouTube with us. So then we cast another girl as Dylan and filmed the entire end sequence with her and like the big reveal and the end sequence actually happened out in the main area of the basement that you see later on in the final version of the ending and it wasn't in that little separate back room that you see in what we use in the movie now but there was a different girl playing the Dylan cop character and we filmed the whole ending. Rachel and I like to communicate with the cast a lot and wish them uh, well and send them praise and thank you after every night of filming. And I made the mistake of messaging everyone after this really long night of filming, the end sequence. And I think I messaged everyone at like two o'clock in the morning or something. And why your phone isn't on silent, I don't know. But the girl that was originally playing Dylan was very, very angry that I sent out a message that late at night saying thank you for coming and filming this and doing such a great job. Even though the message was full of compliments and stuff, she was very, very, very angry and picked a fight with me and then quit production on the spot. So I actually lost the footage from it. Um, not that I think I would show it anyways because it would reveal who this actress was, but... That was a big hit, and that was right at the beginning of production, and we thought we were getting ahead of the game by filming the ending first, and then we had to go back and redo it all, and it kind of got mixed into production and became this like thing that we had to do the ending again. So that one was hard to get over, and that kind of losing the original Shannon and having to replace Dylan twice in Stab 5 was like the start of the curse of Stab movies, Casting people that don't commit to things or that bail for no reason. <laughs> and it just continues. <laughs> so in step five, we also get introduced to Mandy's character, Dylan. Mandy is super sweet. One of the nicest people I've ever worked with, but she was definitely a challenge to work with. Um, I think maybe there was once that she came that she kind of knew her lines and was ready to go. Um, but she took a lot of coaching, which honestly, it's okay. It was great practice, but when everybody else knows their lines and you don't, it is a little frustrating to watch everybody else get, you know, kind of irritated by it. So that was challenging. So love her. And I know that at some point we kept trying to kind of write her out of movies because of that challenge, but the fans loved her so much that we couldn't. We had to keep putting her in movies because that's what you wanted to see. So that is our commitment to you, is even though it was challenging for us, we kept putting her in because you asked for her. You find out that Dylan was basically orphaned and her aunt took her in, and Dylan's like obsessed with Nancy Drew, and her aunt makes fun of her for it, but they're on the police force together, and Regina kind of trained Dylan through all of Stab 5. Dylan really looks up to her, and I think that's why a lot of people liked the Dylan character in Stab 5, was because she was so relatable and she was learning as the movie went on and she was looking up to a family member who really cared about her and really wanted her to succeed. Their relationship was an important one and it was also important that their relationship ended at some point. So Regina does die in Step 5 and it's devastating to Dylan's character. Dylan was not intended to survive Step 5. She has a few lines at the end but we never actually filmed the shot of her dying. So I never had a shot of her dying to show that she doesn't make it. And we could have just explained it in the next movie that she was dead. But she actually 
has was really popular with the fans so we decided to bring her back for stab six and dylan was still alive and then dylan played a really big part in stab six even though she didn't have her on she did kind of have her on guiding her spiritually but dylan reveals a lot of storyline details throughout the movie and she's a pretty important character but i did try to kill her again i love mandy and mandy really does like give it her all uh she's not an actress at all to begin with so we were lucky we got her when we needed her. Mandy has a life and Mandy is busy and Mandy has a hard time learning lines and we work together very well for the most part, but like me, she has her limits. So I kept trying to write her out of the series, but the fans kept wanting her in. And you know, this is honest confession time. Like I said, I love her. I just, um, she wasn't always my favorite person to film with on set because it was usually a challenge with the lines. Usually she just didn't have her lines memorized. She did blow me away. She did come back in one of the movies and one of the scenes she filmed absolutely blew me away and did her whole scene like crazy. And I think it was a confidence thing at first, you know, that she wasn't remembering her lines or maybe, maybe she just didn't spend enough time studying them, but it was a constant pain in the butt to get Manny to learn her lines. So I tried to kill her off in every movie, but because I knew how much the fans loved her, I actually, when we filmed her death scene in Stab 6, I filmed that little clip at the end that if you watch the whole movie all the way through and you watch the credits all the way through, you see that she's still alive and she's crawling her way back to life. And I heavily debated if it was going to make the cut at all. Uh, and I think it did because, like I said, I love Mandy, even though it might be challenging sometimes to work with her. I think the fans were really invested in her character and I was really invested in her. And I appreciated the fact that even though she wasn't an actress, she tried every time she showed up and she gave a hundred percent of what she could. So that's a, that's a tough one for me. The, the Dylan character and I were close to, I liked writing the Dylan character. So killing her off and keeping her and then losing her to other productions is just a, it's a sad experience, you know? Stab 5 was cool too because you also got to see production of the Stab 5 movie that we were making inside of Stab 5. So you got to see me directing, you got to see the characters pretending to be the sound guy and the light guy and stuff like that. The throwback scene to Sarah Campbell and Heather Gale where we have the new actresses playing Sarah Campbell and uh, Jen returning as Heather Gale. And it's, it's just so funny to see Jen jump back into that role. The overacting that they were instructed to do was just, it was so great. I loved every second of it. Staff 5 also marked the first time that we had an out-of-state cast member. Chris O'Brocky came up from Maryland and played an awesome character in the movie. By this time, Staff 4 had gotten so popular that we had a really big fan base online, so we actually held open auditions for Stab 5, where anyone could submit a video audition, and Chris submitted a video audition and fucking killed it, and we loved him and we thought he was awesome, and he flew himself out here and even paid for his own hotel room and stayed here the whole time that we filmed and stuff. Yes, I did pay to fly myself there, but, I, you know, it really, sometimes I work for free, so it wasn't really that big of a deal, because I just wanted to be, I was so excited about it, and I wanted to be part of you know, Stab and, you know, because everybody that has seen all the Scream films knows what Stab is and just, I've really wanted to be associated with that and just with the name and the image that something Wes Craven and Kevin Williamson had created. So, yes, I did pay for myself to go, but it was okay because I was fed when said, you know, I had a place to stay and everything and it was, it was cool. It was, I had a great time. Everybody made me feel very at home and very welcome because I didn't know anybody up there. We get introduced to Chris O'Brocky and his character, Derek. Um, who plays, you know, the staff, basically the film staff. Um, I don't know if he was a grip or sound, but he's in the background, but not because we're filming a movie that includes them, which was interesting. We're shifting now into reality, so it was interesting because we had to film things that would happen normally, like you would normally see a filming crew, but we had to actually put it on camera in a movie, which felt very fake and awkward at times. And that might read a little bit in the movie about how we were gonna position things. I remember looking at a scene and being like, but does this feel real? Because it doesn't feel real to film it. Um, so we had to edit a lot of that. We filmed in a parking garage that we didn't have permission to be in. We went after hours to a bank parking garage and just kind of hoped it would work out. It did. At one point, there were security guards that walked by us and kind of, we were mid-kill, if you will, and they just kind of looked at us and kept walking. I don't know if they realized it was a movie because they saw the camera or if they were just like, not today, uh, but they walked right past us. Yes, my death scene was in a real parking garage. We actually originally had another location that was 
we were going to use instead, which I thought was a much better parking garage because the lighting in there was sick. It was bigger. There was more levels to it, and it just it had a really good dark feel and tone to it. But we got um, <laughs> we all kind of went there. And we we got busted, so we we didn't get to film there. But the one we did film in was it was good. Filming in the parking garage for Chris O'Brocky's death scene was freezing. The whole production was freezing because we filmed in the middle of winter. But the parking garage was one of the worst ones because it was cold, and we went to a parking garage and actually. Go figure, we couldn't film in that parking garage and we didn't know that, so we had to move locations. And Chris actually liked the first parking garage better, but I didn't. I actually thought the second parking garage had cooler lighting because it had like this weird like green tint to it. But uh, his testing was cold and freezing and we were running around and I had a winter coat on under the costume, so I was definitely doing a lot better than he was. And he was covered in blood that was literally starting to freeze to him, like crystallize on him, so that was intense. And I will tell you what it was like. Um, I have never been so cold in my damn life. It was, I'm, I'm further down the East Coast, so I'm used to a lot warmer winters. I mean, we, you know, here in Maryland, it's either a hit or a miss. You know, sometimes we'll get snow, sometimes we won't, or if we do, you know, one year it'll be just a light dusting and then that's it, you know, come one spring. But then, um, you know, last year we had just insane snow, so it's a hit or a miss in Maryland. But up there, they don't play around with snow. And it was, it was freezing, it was really late at night, and um, <laughs> during the scene, um, it was so cold that the fake blood actually started to freeze and kind of start crystallizing to my hand. I could only bend my fingers a tiny bit, so, you know, I'm not one to complain because I'm all about getting the shot, getting in there, doing it, doing a good job. But I kind of, I kind of just stopped Josh, you know, and Rachel kind of in the middle of it. I'm like, you know, I'm not, I don't mean to, you know, be, be a diva or one of those actors, but this, this is kind of bad here. <laughs> and then, you know, Josh's like, oh, come on, let's hurry up and do it then. Why don't you say something sooner? So we, we hurried up and did the shot and, you know, it turned out, it turned out good. I was very, I was very happy with the scene. Josh is a lot of fun to work with. He definitely, he's got a, he's got a very good vibe and vision of what he wants and, you know, he's good about details and everything, which I really like. It just makes it a lot easier to film with and work with somebody who's like that. But Chris is awesome on set and we had a great fucking time working with Chris O'Brocky. Chris Doobie finally got to play the killer, so he was fun to bring back and he brought his friend Steve Matluck with him and they did awesome. Like, they are, in our history, the only two male killers that work together uh, in our stab movies and they are, like, quite the fucking team. I think it was because they were friends in real life that the chemistry between them just played so well, but you really believe that they cared about each other enough and about each other's love lives enough that they would go and kill all these people to get revenge on them for each other. It's Chris DZ, Steve Matlock here, and you guys probably know us, hopefully there's no spoilers right now, but you know us as the killers of Stab 5, killing people. Um, I'd have to say it was really, really fun because I feel like the storyline revolves around that. Like obviously there's the victims and the killers and it was fun to be one of like the main the main players in it instead of just like a side person that kinda gets X'd out or whatever. It's just cool to play a badass. And it's cool to play a badass. We got to wear black shoes, because apparently that's the rules in movies. You always have to wear black shoes if you're the killer. And uh hell yeah, it was fun. Didn't you see the end scene? That was the best part of the freaking movie, I Dude, think. Dude, Chris and I went bananas. Our freaking aggression level was like this high. It was just crazy. The, every other word, f bomb. Oh uh, man, I loved it. I mean, yeah. that's kind of that's kind of me anyway. I got most of the mouth. most of the squares wasn't even in the script. We were just throwing those ones out there. I've known this kid for like ten plus years. Um, my roommate and best friend is pretty much like his brother. Um, and this kid actually got me this gig. Uh, he was over one night, we were all just chilling, and he mentioned, stab, he was talking about Stab 4, and he's like, oh, we're gonna be filming Stab 5, um, and my uh, my grin just went like, Ooh. and he's like, oh, you want you want a part? And I was like, hell yeah, I want a part. So he called up Josh, and uh, I read for the script, and Josh was like, you got it, kid. I know that Steve's a really artsy dude, he likes to do some music. <laughs> And he's always talked about wanting to do like zombie movies. He's big into the zombie stuff. So when I heard that there was a part that opened up, and then I heard that it was gonna be like my like my partner in the movie, yeah, I went right to Josh and freaking told him, listen, this is the dude you want. And hopefully you guys enjoyed the chemistry since you know we're we have already known each other for a long time, so it was real really easy for us to just 
like blended. And I mean, I'm gonna be honest with with the viewers of this questionnaire. I would kill someone, but it would have to be situations. <laughs> you guys don't know that Josh is in the back right now laughing. What up, everybody? Uh, <laughs> I would, would it be situational? It would be like if my life was in harm's way or a family or a friend and I mean I wouldn't go out of my way to be like Superman if there was just some random stuff going on that's when you call the police and let them do their job but you know I could see myself in situations where I could kill someone but it definitely wouldn't be like stabbing up close stuff like that that's that's too intense for me man. Yeah, I won't plead the fifth on that question. How about that? <laughs> Some other obstacles that we ran into were, I would say, cast fatigue. I think the more we film and the later we film, people just forget common sense. And i that's not me picking on them. It just happens. You just get exhausted. You've done the same scene over and over again. And so you start to to lose common sense because you're just tired. And so that played a big part in some of the challenges that we faced in Stab 5 as well. Um, Amanda Constant got her hand cut because we told her a million times to make sure her hands were secured away from the blade. And she was so exhausted that she just reacted and put her hand up and sliced her finger. She needed stitches, it was this whole thing. Hey guys, it's Shayna. So I played myself in Stab 5 um, and my lesbian lover was Amanda Constant. Um, you see the scene where we're doing the auditions for Casey Campbell, and I obviously did not get the part. So when we were walking out is when we kind of revealed that we were lesbians together. Um, and we filmed walking out of that doorway probably like 15 times because I don't, I don't know if we were like laughing or whatnot when we were filming it, but we just kept messing that up. So that was probably like the 50 second take of doing that. Um, another little fun tidbit was that when we were going down the stairs and then the killer calls me um, and Amanda goes back for her purse. So, Ghostface comes out and whatnot, and literally, so Josh was in the Ghostface uh, costume, and he had the knife that we had been using, and he was stabbing away at Amanda, and he like gave her direction to not move her hands, and lo and behold, she did, and he actually ended up <laughs> cutting her finger. So, the ending was we had to go to the hospital and she had to get stitched up there. So um, that was kind of um, a good day of filming, but at the end it ended up not being so great. <laughs> but hey, we got the shot and there may be some real blood in there. So that's kind of fun. <laughs> Same thing happened with Alex. Alex got his chin sliced. Steve, still remember how terribly Steve felt. Steve actually uh, sliced his chin on accident. So those are some of like the, the physical exhaustion things that happen and the problems that are created from that. Well, me, I did um, the fortune teller scene uh, where you see the fortune teller die. It's just a real small part or whatever, but that was me that just did that and then blows. Yeah, buddy. Um, that was the best part of being the killer and just hanging out behind the scenes sometimes because Josh, you know, he had to film. He needed someone to wear the costume. Uh, so I think there were two times where I wore the costume. Um, one was the parking garage scene, and the very end scene, um, I sliced Alex Winter's throat, and there was actually a little mishap one night where the, <laughs> the knife got too close, and I nicked him on the chin, and we had to stop filming, and production was on hold. And he had to get stitches. So Alex, I apologize for that. Uh, we're still cool, um, but yeah. <laughs> Don't wear, worry, man. We all stab people. Wearing a ghost face costume, you feel the power. You feel like a killer. It's kind of creepy. Uh, I love it. Yeah. And with the uh, with the screened out eyes and that mask, you really can't see with no depth. And like I couldn't wear my glasses while I was doing it, so I was probably like this far away from that girl's neck when I did it. I just didn't feel comfortable. And another side note is my probably second favorite part of the movie besides the end is when you see Josh in the parking garage running 
like a freaking giraffe galloping. You know that if it was me or Steve, we wouldn't be running like that. So that's when you know that it's Josh in the costume. <laughs> right. I love the fact that, you know, me and Steve were both main players. Um, we got to do, you know, a bit of normal acting and then over the top screaming, dying. Steve's death scene was ridiculous. Um, but it, I mean, it is a little sad for, you know, that we won't be back in Stab 6, but, you know, Stab 4 was a lot more nerve wracking for me just because it was like the first time being in front of a camera. I've done, you know, the stage theater thing and, you know, that's nerve wracking too, having so many people like watching you, but being in front of the camera and like, it's, it's a different type of animal almost. And I think getting that out of the way with the experience of Stab 4, which I mean, I love doing that movie, but I feel with Stab 5 from the get go, that everyone had more experience under their belt. And I feel like a lot of people agreed that Stab 5 came out better just with, you know, that in mind. And not to mention, I have my boy Steve with me. So, you know, both of us feeding off of each other. Natural talent, natural talent right here. <laughs> so I'd have to say, you know, Stab 5 was a lot more fun just because, you know, I feel the storyline, I think, was a little bit better. And I, like I said, I feel like I was more of a main player and just, the behind the scenes stuff, I feel like we had a lot of fun and we had the most delicious cake I've ever had in my life <laughs> at the Rap of Stat 5. Thank you very much, Karen. It was wonderful. <laughs> we love that you guys love the movie, love the production, love us, our characters. They did such a good job. Like, they're fun actors to begin with, both of whom, like I said, have no acting experience besides being in our movies, but they just bring life and energy to every scene and to bring that level of crazy energy in was just nuts <laughs> just nuts they did such a good job as a living character i have been in one stabmovies.com production uh, but i did show up again in stab six i was not a killer i killed at all my scenes uh, but I unfortunately did not survive Stab 5. I was really appreciative to Josh for bringing me back for a brief cameo in Stab 6. It was it was really cool to be part of the project again. Ariel played Veronica in Stab 5, and that was a fun aspect, too, to introduce this new character that was taking over as Sarah Campbell. Her death scene was also really cold and in a parking garage, but hers has a really cool story, too. Oh, the death scene. It was so fun. I touched on this briefly before, uh, but I had a great time. We were filming in the parking garage across from the Palace Theater in Manchester, New Hampshire, and it was probably... 11 o'clock at night, it was very dark. No one was there, pretty much, apart from us. A couple of cars went by, which was a little scary because the part where I die is actually on one of those ramps heading down to another level. Uh, so I had to lay with my head facing down, looking up towards where the cars would be coming from as the character playing Ghostface was on top of me with the knife, uh, pretending to gut me. Uh, so that was really fun. I got absolutely filthy from the dust on the floor of the parking garage. Um, and I remember it just being a really, really fun evening. Uh, by the end of it, we were tired, we were exhausted, we were dirty, but we had a great time. What happened during it was we were trying I think Josh's character, my character, Veronica, we were trying to escape and we couldn't get into the car and Ghostface is coming and we're trying to just get out of the parking lot and run away. We end up running across uh, one level of the parking garage, starting to run down and Josh's character tripped. And in her one moment of selflessness, Veronica stopped, tried to help him and I remember Ghostface grabbed me by the shoulder, turned me over, and that's when I started screaming and just started stabbing. And Josh is like, bye! Because <laughs> his character uh, was very similar to Veronica in that way. A lot of self-preservation. I had a shirt on that was a yellow sweater that 
I wore for a couple of scenes. And then I just happened to, a couple of years before, done uh, Drew Barrymore's character from Scream, Casey Becker, as a Halloween costume. So I had a very similar yellow sweater that was already cut up, had all the blood effects on it. And what we did, because they weren't exactly the same, the yellow sweaters, was I wore a gray sweatshirt uh, that was unzipped over it. So you could kind of tell if you look really closely that they're not exactly the same, those two different sweaters. And we went through the scene up until the moment where Ghostface started stabbing and we called cut. And I changed out my shirts very quickly, lay back down on the ground, and he went to town. And that blood was cold, I remember. Very, very sticky, very, very cold. Uh, we, even though there was already blood effects on the shirt, we had to add even more of it. It was, it was great. It was a lot of fun. After she dies, I run away without my shoes on because the killer had to borrow my shoes because it was Steve Matluck playing the killer at that time. So I remember having to run in the freezing cold winter in the parking garage in my shoes and that really sucked. My car that I owned at the time was a Chevy Cobalt, I believe it was gold. And they had had a recall on the, the springs and the door mechanisms would not allow the back doors to close because they were actually plastic springs. They weren't metal. And so, not even in the movie, but like throughout our entire friendship that I own this car, I had a sign like in the window that said, do not open door, don't unlock. And we were so good about it. And this night, we weren't. So after filming in the middle of winter in a freezing cold parking garage that we weren't supposed to be in, uh, Derek's character was on the ground. Ariel was running around the levels of the parking garage. We went to go home and Josh forgot that we're not supposed to open that door and we actually couldn't close my door. So we spent so much time. I had to call my brother, shout out to Chris, who nobody ever sees anything about the movies because he's not involved, but he helped us more in Stab 5, I think, than he will ever know because the movie would not have gone forward if we could not have gotten home. Um, he came out and fixed my door temporarily. And I believe one more time that happened, even though it shouldn't have because we should have remembered after how terrible that night was. Side note, if you're watching carefully when we drive away because the door would not physically close, the door is actually open as we drive off. So if you watch it again, that'll be a fun fact and a fun thing for you to catch. So Stab 5 is also when Rachel finally gets to step up and start participating a lot more too. She's got a much bigger character in Stab 5. Uh, she's playing herself and she is technically part of the cast of Stab 4 still because she had that little cameo. And she's uh, basically my assistant in the movie, so her part is huge. She's the assistant director. And then she also expanded her roles behind the scenes, too. So there's a lot more scenes that Rachel helped film in that, that Rachel helped set up, and she helped organize the cast and send out emails and keep everybody in line and help them go over their lines. Like, Rachel is the best partner in crime you could ask for when making a movie. Like, if I'm busy because we don't have a crew and I have to go set up lighting and stuff, Rachel is in a separate room with the cast, drilling lines into their head and letting them know what I'm not going to like about it because we've worked together so many times that she can just know, mm, Josh isn't going to like the way you said that. That line so it's actually pretty awesome and I'm always excited to write for Rachel uh, I try to empower the Rachel character a lot and it's a slow process Rachel's character shows more growth than any of the other characters over the process of the stab movies she starts off as my assistant and she kind of takes my shit even though she complains about it here and there and gives like a little bit of it back to me you know but every movie she gets stronger and stronger and stronger and more powerful until she just that bitch Rachel Dab Bitch, yo. If you don't know, Rachel Dab Bitch. She's also the queen of stab, if you didn't know this. Rachel has appeared in more stab movies and short movies for stabmovies.com than any other of our actresses. Uh, Nicole Linton is a close second, but Rachel still has two movies ahead of hers. So, But Rachel, the queen of stab, we bow down to you. We love you. You fucking killed it in Stab 5. Remember in Stab 5, one of the new things that we had to work on is it's the first time we had to do real location scouting. Even though throughout all of the stab movies, there's this inside joke that it's always at Josh's apartment. Um, you see them everywhere. You see that orange mirror and the red couch like you see it all um and we've tried to disguise it in many ways throughout the movies but it remains but for step five there were some things that we just could not do from josh's apartment and one of those was a fortune teller scene we needed to find a place that that would be believable 
And so I remember I went looking and I scoured and I found Myth and Maidens, which is in Manchester, New Hampshire. It's a great little shop. And they had a basement, which we weren't even aware of. And they gracefully let us come and film there. But ironically, again, like the flashbacks in Stab 4, even though I wrote the flashbacks and I wasn't there, I found Myth and Maidens, never saw the inside of it, was not there for filming at all. So everybody else got to kind of check it out and have fun. And to this day, I still have never stepped foot inside of Myth and Maidens, not because I haven't wanted to, just because I haven't done it yet. I do remember meeting Jen and she's like a big ball of energy and she's just the biggest sweetheart. You just want to grab her and play. Like you feel like you're a little kid again. And um, Chris is kind of the same way. He's like a joker and we had a lot of fun doing our scene together at Myths and Maidens. I just remember this really unique shop that had like all these really cool trinkets and we had this whole thing set up and it was kind of like seance -y, kind of like spooky. Um, I kind of got like a little Ooh, this is gonna be cool. I wonder if there's any spirits here. I know I'm s such a little weirdo about that. In Staff 5, we wanted to try different levels of horror, I guess you could say, too, and different horror tropes or horror themes that you would see in other movies. And a, a real classic thing is people going to fortune tellers. So we added in a fortune teller, and it was our fortune teller was played by a girl named Ashley Swang, who was just fantastic. And we had such a fun time with her on set and she got thrown into the mix and she got thrown into a lot of crazy stuff and she had, we filmed at this store called Myth and Maidens in Manchester and they had a beautiful store and it really did look like an occult store, but we filmed upstairs and downstairs there and upstairs was beautiful and downstairs was like, what are we doing here? And I could see the, the nervous looks on everybody's faces when we started, but we, I, I, for the most part, I think we made it work. I wish we had brought some more props to kind of fill out the shelves or maybe borrowed some stuff from the store to fill out the shelves down in where we did the, uh, the tarot card reading part. Ashley did an awesome job and she took her death scene well and that was also another one that was a catastrophe because we didn't have a right costume and we couldn't get blood anywhere. It, it was rough and Ashley was a real trooper through it and we made it work and Chris Duby actually got to play the killer in that scene because he was the killer in the movie so it was cool to get to use him for that. Um, everything that we filmed at the fortune teller store, we basically had a film in one day, so we were jumping all different kinds of scenes all around and bouncing it. Hi, I'm Ashley Slank. I played the fortune teller in Stab 5. I knew Josh from working at Chili's. We had a whole crew of us, and we all sort of got parts within the film, and uh, Josh cast me specifically as the fortune teller because I was the weird one. <laughs> Playing the fortune teller was actually kind of fitting because I was pretty well versed in being in magic shops and I have a ton of crystals. I actually had tarot decks at home. So it, it really worked well for me to just kind of step right into the role. So we get there and we walk into this beautiful crystal and magic shop, Myth and Maiden, and uh, it was gorgeous upstairs and then like okay so you can film in the basement and we get down there and it is just black carpet black walls heavy bright lights <laughs> and i was like how is this gonna work and i could see josh he's scrambling in his own head trying to set up a table to make it look pretty authentic and we're sitting there and we're all looking at each other like this is gonna be weird <laughs> but somehow it worked it was odd just more so because i had a hard time envisioning how it was going to look through the camera because we were in the basement and i recall the lights being a lot brighter than i thought they should have been so i was kind of like taken out of my my headspace a little bit just because i was like how's he gonna make this work how's he gonna do this and not to mention being in the basement, I was like, you know, there's no crystals, there's nothing down here. It's a dark, empty basement. And uh, somehow, somehow Josh actually made the lighting work. Um, the finished product was a lot better than I thought it was going to be, which it was a pleasant surprise. I remember they let us borrow one of their absolutely beautiful velvet cloaks, and they were like, you can't get this dirty. So I'm like, okay, so I'm dying. There's gonna be fake blood. We can't get anything dirty. We can't get blood on the floor. We can't get blood on the rental cloak that we are using. I wasn't 
fully prepared with my own costume that I kind of brought. I just had like scarves and stuff all over me because I thought I'd be wearing a cloak the whole time. So we get to the death scene and there's blood and I'm like, I can't actually do anything because I can't get blood anywhere. So I just sort of like awkwardly just like fell off the side of the camera shot. <laughs> it somehow worked. I was just in like plain clothes under it because I thought I was going to be wearing the cloak the whole time. I wasn't really prepared with a costume under the costume, which we didn't know until after the fact that I was going to need. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all went in there having an idea of what it was going to be, and then we were completely thrown through a loop. <laughs> and like just Tim Gunn. Make it work. Yeah. <laughs> I had like a scarf that I had draped in my lap to catch anything because I'm like, well, we can't, we can't even get one drop on the floor of this empty room with a black carpet. Don't get any blood on the floor. You know, we might use this room for something. <laughs> <laughs> we did get to film upstairs at some point. Um, I think I was being interviewed by a detective and I had an earring and I just sort of walked around the shop just like just adjusting little trinkets. So, I mean, the store did get a day of work out of me because I walked around and I did all of their facing and I made their shelves look gorgeous. So, yeah, they, they, got, they got some work out of us. Well, I tried to make it look like I was actually working there. And not just having it as a backdrop, but, you know, this is my store, so I have to make it look good. But I remember when I watched the scene for the first time in the movie and I had to sniff the earring and Josh had dubbed like a sniff sound over it, so it was like <laughs> <laughs> I laughed so hard watching that. Cause... Oh yeah, I mean, it was completely unmiked, so we did have to sort of enunciate clearly. And, and uh, I mean, none of us really knew what we were doing, but at the same time, um, Josh's excitement of the project kind of got us all involved. And by the time we all got there, we were all pretty invested in, in what was going on and yeah it's, he was so excited about it I mean, how could you say no to that <laughs> you're so invested in the things you do with like your books you you wrote several movies I mean who does that in their free time and so it was sort of like okay we have to say yes because like we have to help this this friend see his idea come to fruition the only person there that I knew was you and uh, Chris, who ends up being our killer. So there's two girls I've never met in my entire life. And I, I went there thinking, like, I'm going to do a, this accent. And then I got so choked up because I'm like, oh, this girl, I don't know. And she looks like one of those cool girls that would have never have let me, like, sit at the lunch table with them. And I just got so clammed up. But she ended up being really nice. Everyone there was really nice. <laughs> like, I remember she had to get really freaked out at her card reading. And she's super committed. I mean... Stephanie, yeah. Yeah, she's... I'm still in my head going, like, how the heck are these lights gonna work? This is way too bright for a tarot reading. But she was, like, into it. And even Chris, he was into it as well. I mean, I, I actually felt like they were angry at me for a minute. I'm like, whoa. They are I'm like... Just, I'm just a nice little tarot reader. I want to address my death scene. <laughs> All right, let's move on to your death scene. <laughs> Talk about it. <laughs> so, my death scene, um, we had to set up this rig, but of course everything was not what we had expected it to be when we got there. So, I had this little hose tucked between my finger, and I was just holding it to my neck, and Josh was behind me, with like a giant syringe just like shooting blood out of it. But again, couldn't get any on the floor, couldn't get any in the costume. So I'm just like holding it like awkwardly, try to let it just dribble down. And then I just like fell over dead. Cause it's like, what do you do? You can't move. And so, I mean, that was, it was interesting to say the least. Um, Cause in my head I had thought like, okay, I'm gonna do this whole like death thing. And then we get there. <laughs> so we did use a real knife, um, 
Chris had to swing a knife at me, which um, I was a little scared at because my role mainly at Chili's was to expedite, which meant I just screamed at the kitchen staff most nights that I was there. And he was kitchen staff, and I'm like, oh god, my nacho guys might actually take this opportunity to kill me because I have yelled at this poor man hundreds and hundreds of hours of my life. <laughs> But here I am. He didn't kill me. I mean, other than the fake blood, everything was pretty real. It was a little scary. A little bit. Oh, yeah. I mean, because you're in your head, you're thinking like, okay, so I'm just going to let this guy swing an actual weapon at my throat and hope for the best. I, I believe he was standing behind me for my death scene too, and it's like, so, I mean, had he not calculated that angle right for the camera, I mean, I, I, he wasn't that far away from my actual skin with a real knife. It's what we do for the craft. <laughs> uh, the best part was just seeing how it all came together. Um, it was fun showing up, kind of getting thrown for a loop, because you show up thinking, oh, this is just going to be another humdrum day, and then all of a sudden we are in the basement of a magic shop, really making the best out of the situation, but you're doing so with a bunch of other people who are also going through that with you, so it was, it was kind of nice. It was, it was a fun day. In the end, it was, it was well worth kind of getting through that, and seeing the, the end product when it was upload it to YouTube and you're like, oh, the lighting did work. <laughs> and I'm not sure if it was like filtering or if what went on, but I mean, and the magic shop walking around it felt kind of natural. And I mean, the fact that everything worked in the end, it was, it was interesting to see just the final cut. She well, it is real. I mean, the entire time we're filming, we got someone at the counter, like, just staring at us, making sure we didn't break anything. It did have an essence of reality to it, because it is a real shop that actually exists with an owner that actually cares about their merchandise. Customers walking in and out, and didn't they have a bell on the door? So it would be like mid-shot and hear, ding! <laughs> and Bill's smacking against the glass of the door. <laughs> <laughs> a couple cuts. I mean, you get a couple box trucks driving outside. You pick that up on the cameras. It's, yeah, it was, it was interesting, but we made it work. I mean, I swear you could be in the middle of the woods without a road even near you, and like a jumbo jet will fly overhead just because you have to get those sounds on camera. <laughs> Every time something goes wrong, it's nine times out of ten something that's completely beyond our control. Or, you know, like, oh, we just got a massive snowstorm and our set won't be melted for another six months. Patty, her scenes, she's like walking up frozen staircases. And yeah, I remember snow being an issue that year. <laughs> a lot of frozen cast members. I did like it. It was enjoyable. Um, Josh does have experience as a writer, so it felt, it felt more natural conversation. Whereas, you know, sometimes you sit down and, like, if I were to sit down and, and try to write a character, it would be very blocky and not natural. And, like, who would ever talk like that? But the script had a flow to it that felt real. Um, I think I stayed mostly on the script, but it, of course, there's a little bit of ad libbing because I'm not a professional actor and I have not memorized any lines. But I knew the gist of what I was supposed to do. And, the more more important cues of the script, so we we did stay faithful as, as much as an unprofessional first timer can. I think the only comment I actually ever read um, was on the Facebook page. Someone said I looked like Lindsay Lohan, and I was like, "What? <laughs> I've never heard that before." But yeah, I've uh, I've heard I'm long time fan. All the all the people on the couch said, "Don't read the YouTube comments," and I, I didn't. People also forget, like, we're not paid, we're not professionals. I was a waitress at a Chili's when we made this. In school, to be a phlebotomist, there's nothing in my resume that would scream actor. Um, so uh, we're people. We're just normal people, like just. This was just a thing we were doing for our friend and we had a good time doing it.
But yeah, people do tend to forget, like, this isn't a million dollar budget. Right. This, we didn't have a budget. Like, there was nothing. None of us got paid one red cent to do this. It was just... Well, I want to, like, reach my, my, my hand into the internet sometimes and just be like, you go out with your friends out in the woods or just about town and make something better. But have it actually cohesive to something that actually kind of tangibly already existed. So the, the Stab movies, if I recall correctly, were the series of movies that they are actually watching in the Scream franchise. So the fact that we had someone take this millisecond of a, of a real Hollywood motion picture and roll with that idea and make several movies that have actual tangible storylines that fit in with a made-up universe, I'd love to see anyone try to do something better. Uh, the worst part was um, just what you build up in your head. Like, I had this, in my, my head, this elaborate death scene, and they basically tied our hands with just like we we can't we can't misplace even one drop of the fake blood so just yeah having our hands tied that way and it was i think i think everyone felt a little disappointed cuz we all had read the script we all had this idea of who our characters were and then it was like we get there and the shackles got put on and uh, so it, that was a little disappointing I loved the uh, the finding out who the killers were. I loved that big reveal and uh, finding out it was it was Chris the whole time and was it Steve? To find out after the fact, I mean. Did you guys you guys didn't know who the killers were when you were filming? I only knew because I filmed with Chris and he put the mask on to kill me. But I didn't know if that was actually the killer or if that was just a stand-in for the day to have him so at the end of the movie when I find out oh no that really really was the killer because yeah I didn't I didn't entirely know I only got a couple pages of the script that had my dialogue in it so I didn't even get a full copy much much like how they do the Marvel films where just the actors get just their little part um, but yeah I I kind of had assumed in my head that Chris was just a stand-in for that day because we didn't have enough space to have a whole production there. And then, yeah, he really was the killer. Some of the other challenges that we experienced in Stab 5 is because it was the first time we had a new cast and it wasn't just that we were doing it for fun, it's that we were honestly trying to start creating content was that we had a cast that had some experience and with that came the what I call the idea train. Um, it's interesting to see how many people want to put on a director's cap when they are making a movie. And so many people, while we were trying to get scenes filmed, would throw in ideas and that would just delay it. Um, and we started just kind of entertaining them and trying to be polite and then realized we quickly had to draw a line in the sand and say, hey, the movie's already written. It doesn't need any edits. We're gonna film from here on out. I know that that happened in um, the scene where I'm getting my makeup done and, or I'm doing makeup rather. And um, there's a singing scene. There were so many people throwing out ideas on what song they wanted to sing, which was interesting because I was the one that was supposed to be singing, not them. Um, and they just, you know, wanted to hop on board and it just kind of became this mess that took far longer than it should have. Uh, the end product was great. So glad that we got there. So this just gives you an idea of the, the delays and the challenges that we faced. And even though, you know, the end product was great, we recovered from it. Um, it really started to teach us about how we were going to have to approach certain things like, you know, script not needing edits. And though it's great to take ideas from people, it, there needs to be a boundary. And so that was a learning thing for Josh and myself as well. And uh, to this day, we've put it into practice and we'll take some ideas and examples at the beginning and then that's kind of over so that we can keep moving. I got to go to the premiere of Scream 4 in Hollywood which is really cool. This is actually the shirt I wore to the premiere of Scream 4 and it's an outfit I wore in Stab 5 too during the audition sequences. But um, I got to go to the premiere of Scream 4 and when the movie ended I had to text Rachel and tell her that we now had to change some of the ending again. What I had written for the end of Stab 5 was so close to the end of Scream 4 that it was mind-blowing. It was almost like 
Kevin Williamson and I had seen each other's scripts and kind of bounced off of them and went with the same ideas. So originally the killer in Stab 5 was one of Jennifer's cousins. <laughs> Go freaking figure who wanted the spotlight and she was jealous of all the attention Jennifer got for being involved in this. So she was the killer and that character is actually still in the movie. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I'll see if you can figure it out on your own. And uh, she does die but she would have come back to be revealed as Jennifer's cousin and as one of the killers. So we had to fix that. <laughs> and Steve and Chris became the killers and that ending was reworked so that it was now a love story and a revenge story and no longer a story of a jealous cousin trying to take the leading role. But I didn't die. I came back and I saved the day and I shot some mother is in the face. <laughs> And I just want to say thank you to all my fans because you're like the reason why I came back here. I have a baby at home and my life is crazy and we're in quarantine. But I really appreciate anyone and everyone that wants to send positive energy towards me, towards the STAB series, towards Josh. So I just want to say honestly thank you so much for everything that you guys do to support us. I hope that Josh continues to create content like this. It is really fun to see what he's come up with throughout the years. Uh, it's great that he's been able to continue the story that Wes Craven created so many years ago. Uh, it is the only scary movie franchise that I enjoy. I don't like scary movies. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but I do love Scream and I do love Stab. And I want to thank Josh for having me be a part of this. So in short, Stab 5 was stage two of the Stab movies process. Uh, we learned a lot in Stab 4 that we brought to Stab 5, but we learned even more in Stab 5 that we brought to Stab 6. And so it's an important film for us, and I really enjoyed making it. I think from Stab 4, it was definitely a step up production-wise, uh, script-wise, and acting-wise. I think, you know, a lot of stuff really improved. and. Overall, I'm very happy with Stab 5. It's probably one of my favorite stabs that we've made so far.